and welcome to another edition of The Mailbag with me, John. Remember, these are questions and comments you guys leave on the channel, so it's part of the community. And we do our humble best to try and answer or comment on them. But before we do that, remember, the normal parish notices apply. So, if you haven't subscribed, why not? Hit that subscribe button. If you want to be notified when this sort of content or any other content hits the, hits the channel, the bell icon is the button to press. Go press it now. If you want to support the production of videos on the channel, consider supporting me over on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash the music tech guy. The address will be down here somewhere. And we are still in the midst of COVID-19. So remember, stay at home, stay safe, wash the hands, wash the pinkies until Boris tells us not to. Now, back to the main content of this video. Boop, boop. So, the first one for this section comes from Post24. And he writes, A80, nice, nice, nice. And there is enough space, is there enough space to put a monitor on beside the pitch bent? Um, and again, this is the same, but the, the, this video gets a lot of hits. Um, which is the Roland A80 video that I did back in uh, boom, 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 boom. read the right piece of paper uh, September 2017 and um, boom, boom, boom. as you face the keyboard if you look at the A80 if you were facing the keyboard and the A80 was in front of you you've got lots of space on the right hand side Okay, and I Often when I am using the A80, that's where I put my Mac because it sits quite nicely on that sort of end quarter. So you possibly could get a monitor there. But if you then look at the right-hand side, the distance between, they've effectively what they've got is they've got down here, they've got the, the classic Roland wiggy wiggy woggle woggle um, sort of uh, pitch bend and modulation uh, joystick and then over here they've got two um, wheels so you can do it either way on the A80 and because of the two wheels that are on the left hand side and the distance between those wheels and the control the first set of controls there's not enough space there to put a monitor so unfortunately the simple answer to your your question is um, no there's not And the next question comes from Daniel Levy. And he writes, I have an Oasis which still has one gig of RAM. I haven't yet opened it up. What two gig would I need? Is it a single kit or a, or a two slot kit? What part would I need, Daniel? So um, this was in the uh, response to a, a mailbag item I did on sort of the art of DJ and three gig Oasis. Um, Etc. that I did in December 2019. Now, what's really interesting about this is that um, I did a bunch of research because somebody said, "Oh, you can put two, you can put a two gig module in, you get three gig, and then if you change the original chip over to a two gig, you get four gig." Uh, and I sort of kind of looked at the original specs for the board, and yes, the board will support four gig of RAM. Um, but, and there is a but, and I said this on the video, uh, the Oasis is only a 32-bit operating system because, you know, we've only really moved to 64-bit uh, operating systems last 10 years. Um, but it's a 32-bit operating system. And as such, a 32-bit operating system theoretically can address 4 gig of RAM. But in reality, they, could, they really only address 3.5 gig of RAM, um, even if there is 4 gig available on the machine. So that was kind of the sort of me turning around and saying, well, the board will support it. The base operating system before the core gizms are added will support it. However, I've done some more research on this. And even though it is touted that the operating system will support it, Korg, although they don't support it anyway, so it's a bit of a sort of mute conversation, it's, but Korg effectively only supported a 2 gig configuration. So the question is, do you risk putting more memory into your board 
Um, and if you do want to put more memory into your board, if something goes wrong and you ring Korg up, they probably will wash their hands of it because they're supported 2 gig. Um, so that's kind of where the first thing is. My Oasis, which I, I have here, um, only is only upgraded to 2 gig, and I did that by putting an additional 1 gig DIM into this. And the DIM you're after is a 1 gig, 1024 megabyte DDR 184 pin DIM. Okay, and I will put that down below. Um, so theoretically, you could put two times two gig chip DIM chips in here, and you get four gig. The other thing I've noticed is that if you go and look up this DIM chip specification on the interweb, you will find lots of people selling five twelve and lots of people selling one gig. Because at the end of the day, this is a computer, and so it will support certain types of, of DIM types. But you will not find, in fact, I did a search last night, and I couldn't find one person or one company selling a 2 gig DIM um, chip of this specification. So even though it's theoretically possible, and the guy from the particular Mayberg said, you could do it, I think you struggle to actually find the DIM chips to put into the machine to allow you to do it. So it looks like um, two gig is scarce. You're going to be stuck with two times one gig. You've already got one gig in the machine. You need to go and buy another one gig, which is this um, 1024 megabyte DDR 184 pin DIM memory. And the next one comes from Andreas Frankel, and he writes, following, got an old System 85, uh, SY85 yesterday for 100 euros. Well, that was a good price. Uh, and the broke, the floppy is broken too. Could the SY85 floppy swapped with a floppy emulator like? And he gives me a YouTube reference. Um, and the answer is, uh, in short, yes. Okay. Uh, and this is in response to the sequence of videos I'm doing at the moment about uh, fixing the SY85, which is sitting there at the moment. And the reason why it's sitting there is because I have been waiting for the disk drive to turn up. So there's the disk drive. It actually turned up this week, so it is my intention to finish the restoration on that particular board this weekend. Um, so that is sitting just behind me. Um, for doing that. So, as I say, in short, the answer is yes, you can put an emulator in there um, and it can be used as an alternative to floppy drive. So, for those who are not familiar with an emulator, it's like, like a GoTech drive, um, emulates the functions of a floppy disk drive. And what you do is you effectively put a memory stick in the in the relevant drive and you copy, the you make a partition or a folder on the memory stick and into that memory stick you put in a uh, a copy of each one of the disks that you want to load, and effectively what then happens is it just you you on the on the GoTech or the the emulator you tell it which partition you want to load, and it will then go and load all the sounds in that particular partition, okay, and it effectively reads them as if it was reading a floppy disk drive, um, uh, and I think uh, basically the choice is yours you choose whether you're going to put an emulator in or you choose whether you're going to put the original disc in. Now, for me, personally, I normally go back to the original discs, um, especially when I'm doing a restoration job. I start with making bringing the keyboard back to life in its original configuration before I then start making modifications to it. So I may go to a GoTech drive in the future um, or an emulator. But at this point in time, I'm not, so I, I haven't gone down that route, so I can't really advise you. Um, what I will say, um, looking at comments that other people have had when loading emulators up is, quite often you buy the emu you need to make sure you buy an emulator that has been specifically set up for the machine you are putting it into, otherwise you're going to have fun trying to work, trying to get the pin configuration to work. So just to give you an idea, the SY85 that's sitting there is a 24-pin connection. Actually, it's a 24-pin ribbon connection, whereas a standard disk drive 
um, that you might buy to try and replace that is a 36 and it's a pin connection, not a ribbon connection. So you've automatically got a problem. You've got to build a pin interface to make a newer drive work with this machine. And you've got the same with the GoTex or the emulators. So <coughs> there are lots of people pumping these emulators out, but you've got to make sure that that emulator has 24 pins on it, and those 24 pins are aligned to the way that that thing works. Um, the other the other issue that I've um, seen people talking about is if you've got disks, is actually getting those disks copied onto the the stick. Um, and you may think that is a relatively simple process, but going through the the pain I went through to get the solution in place for the uh, the sound and media library um, that I've now got, uh, I can tell you it's not trivial. There are there are quite a lot of head scratchy moments to get the configuration right to read the disks of that particular machine into uh, your machine and then out to the the USB drive. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is, and this is what I found, is I had to go and buy a Windows XP machine to do that because I couldn't get it to run on anything higher than Windows 7. So these are all the considerations that you might think about when going down this route. So the last one for this section, <laughs> and I've still got another mailbag set to do after this. So the last one for this section comes from Francisco Zabor Zababorzo. Um, I do apologize. Um, and it says, from when Roland was the best keyboard synthesizer maker in the whole world, I'm sad to see, that, to see they abandoned their mission about 15 years ago. Um, and this was in response to a video I did on the U20 where I just sort of demoed the, the demo songs on the U20. Um, and I have to say, do I agree with that statement? I'm not sure I do completely. Um, I think Roland went through a period in the 80s where, and, and a lot of the other manufacturers were doing the same, where they were just pumping keyboards out into the market space. Um, and some of those keyboards were good, and some of those keyboards were dire. Okay. Um, and Roland was no better in terms of some of their keyboards, like the U20. The U20 was sort of kind of designed for um, the the keyboardist who was playing in a scenario where what they needed was like stock sounds. So they needed a, a good piano, and they needed a, a good string section, and they needed a good sort of brass stabby type sound. Uh, and Roland pumped out all those sort of sterling sounds on the sort of the SN cards. And you could just pop the card into the back of the the, um, the U20 uh, and sort of go, right, okay, give me a piano. And you could go off and play your piano set. And at the end of the song, you would whip the card out, put the next card in, select strings, and you'd be the sort of the string accompaniment to whatever you were doing. That's kind of what the U20 was designed about. Um, and, you know, in terms of that sort of thing, it, it worked okay. But it didn't have longevity of support. In fact, you know, it didn't la didn't last very long. It only hang around for a couple of years, because the, by 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 their very nature, keyboardists want to fiddle, and you want to adjust the parameters of the sound, and you want to personalise the sound. Uh, and that was something that sort of the the Ropplers wouldn't allow you to do. You know, that was the sound. That's what you got. And if you didn't like it, well, you know, kind of tough and lump it really. Um, so would I say? that they were making were the best manufacturer in the world. I think Korg, uh, with some of the stuff that Korg was doing, and definitely some of the high-end synthesizers that Yamaha were pushing out. I mean, remember, you know, we're talking about Yamaha synthesizers here, um, but Yamaha have a very good track record in digital pianos. I mean, I had a Clavin over for years, and it was a beautiful keyboard to play. Um, had a beautiful sound on it. It was just limited to six piano and harpsichord type sounds. That was it. You couldn't play anything else because they didn't have anything else. It was a piano. It was designed to be a piano. And they also do. I mean, I can remember you know when I was uh, uh, a friend of mine used to work in one of the music shops, uh, and you know they this particular shop wasn't uh, wasn't Project Music. And you've heard me talk about Project Music on this channel many times. Um, but it wasn't Project Music. And they sold digital pianos and organs. 
And Yamaha built some fairly substantial organs that were just phenomenal to play. But, you know, we don't talk about that on the, on this channel because we're all talking about synthesizers. But you know, you remember they Roland Roland didn't really get into the into the into the organ market. They were sort of more synthesizers and digital pianos and but they, they were doing lots of other different things at the same time. So I'm not sure I would say that, that the same. Um and I think there was probably other notable mentions here like Cowie, um, Kurtzwell were doing some really good stuff. There was um I think they're the only ones that really spring to mind in terms of, sort of but there were other niche players, you know, you know, the vision that was Mog, you know, the, those Mog synthesizers, they carried on sequential Dave Prophet, although, you know, to be honest, many of the key beds on those early synthesizers were pitiful and abysmal, but they still had different visions about what the synthesizer should be and people loved them for it. But it's well worth sparking the debate.